So why trabecton? Well, the difference quite easily is 180 degrees versus only two clock hours. This is a graphic that shows as a background image the outflow system. That's what we're dealing with with minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. This is Schlem's canal here. And these are the collector channels. This is uh, a canalography done by our glaucoma imaging group at UPMC. And the devices that you see here are the eye stand inject this little, this little device, this is the second generation eye stand. This here is the first generation eye stand. And this is the hydrus. This here is the trabectome. And right next to it is something that has been tried in Europe for some time. It's an endoscopic laser that allows to do gonio puncture, essentially. And now if you compare this, well, one single axis allows you access to about two clock hours of drainage segments. And as these devices get longer, you get more extensive access. And why couldn't you just insert a little device and hope that you would get circumferential flow? The answer is there is no circumferential flow. Take a look at Schlem's canal here. Many septations, many areas of discontinuity, and even areas of duplication. And that is, that is the reason why, if you've ever tried canalplasty, that, that's why you can sometimes not get the catheter around. But if you have a device that ablates only the inner wall, then you can tap into all these segments without getting stuck. All right, why is this, um, why is this a nice surgery? Well, first of all, what is it? It's, a, it's really a not cautery. Don't think of it as cautery. It is a bipolar 550 kilohertz ablation technique. It creates something that's, that one could call a, myco, a pico lightning, and it creates a 200 micron plasma cloud. It removes the primary pathology of glaucoma, and that, of course, is the juxtacanalicular meshwork. That's where the main part of the flow resistance is. Plasma sounds scary, lightning also. So what does it really do? Doesn't it create a lot of heat as in uh, cautery? No, it doesn't. The uh, heat dissipation uh, cone is very confined and it's also protected against the outer wall with a foot plate. So really the heat is created, the plasma is created between the rod and the other electrode here. Um, and you know plasma already from your lasers that it's the same kind of fourth state of matter. When you look at an electron microscopic image, you can see the outer wall here denuded, and you, what you don't see are the uh, lips that, for instance, goniotomy uh, would leave behind. Let's zoom into this picture a little more. Why doesn't goniotomy work well in adults? Well, look at these orifices here, the openings, the intakes into the drainage system that I've shown you before as this canalography. If you now imagine two wound lips left behind in goniotomy, this is easily rolled over, these very anterior ones and the very posterior ones. But if you ablate this entire tissue, you potentially can get access to all of those. And of course, there are challenges with uh, the newer stents. Um, as much hope as we have that these minimally invasive surgeries work well, they can incite fibrosis, they can be occluded, um, and other scaffold devices that are meant to open it wider, as any device, they can compress adjacent tissues. So there are key steps. Um, you have to follow certain key steps. I'm guilty of uh, abandoning this, this surgery for six months. I, said, I figured it, it doesn't work. I don't know why it's not working. Um, it's removing the primary pathology. Then I talked to experienced surgeons, and I reviewed my cases that came back at six months. And the ones who failed and others who didn't. And um, here's my, my hopefully distilled wisdom. First of all, you have to visualize. You have to have an excellent microscope. If you don't have a good microscope and you don't see what you're doing, you will not get good outcomes. You must have good tilt. Xenon, large tilt, what microscope is the only one that is available in the United States that does that? Um, it, I think it is only the uh, Zeiss Lumera, unfortunately. But the xenon light, if you can get a xenon light source, you should be fine. This is a more bluish light, and it allows you to see a lacy structure that is semi-translucent. Uh, don't use viscoelastic. Those of you who had experience with the first generation packages have used viscoelastic, but you're trapping bubbles, you're trapping blood, and you will not see. So don't use viscoelastic. Then I will show you how to induce hypotony to identify the structure, because this is perhaps the most common cause of trabectome failure. 
you're not doing trabecular mesh work ablation. You're blading the ciliary body. That brown structure in the angle that you thought was the mesh work is actually <laughs> a highly arterial structure called the ciliary body. Lots of bleeding, high pressure, and you will never do this procedure again. So you have to identify the mesh work and the canal. Second, the technique. How can you get a better reach? How can you prevent iris prolapse? I will show you that too. You have to make an odd anterior incision that is not your cataract incision, and you have to flare it. That sounds like, an, like a sub-ideal incision that potentially will leak, but that's what you need for trabecum surgery. More is more in this case. Aim for 180 degree ablation. More ablation means increasing your odds of tabbing into these drainage segments. So it is probably just a statistical thing that, you, that your chances are higher. But perhaps it also uh, allows for lower pressures in the end. First of all, large tilt is key. Many patients who we operate on are elder patients. They don't have a highly mobile neck. So you want to have something that tilts well. And you want to be using xenon light. This is the difference right here. On the left side, you see a microscope that has a fairly crisp xenon light. And on the right side, you see another microscope that does not. And then <laughs> this is both me operating. And unfortunately, the right is one of my first ones at UPMC that I did for our chair as a co-surgeon, because he knew I have great outcomes with trabectome. Um, and sure enough, that ended up not well. What you will see here on the right side is later on, I probably go after the ciliary body or something happens, there is blood. You should not see blood during the ablation. The eye is pressurized, the bottle is high, the pressure is above 40 or so, uh, just due to the infusion pressure. There is no reason why you would see reflux from a venous tissue from Schlemm's Canal. All right, so get a good microscope, very important. No viscoelastic, trapping bubbles, making it blurry, creating interfaces, optical interfaces, and you will not be able to induce hypotony. You need hypotony in order to see uh, well. First of all, let's start with the incision. Straight in, parallel to the iris, then you nick to the left and you nick to the right to flare it even further. This will allow you to extend your reach with the trabectome without creating stria. And by placing it about two millimeters anterior, the iris will not come flying. It's a short incision, so it's very likely to suck the iris um, into the wound if you place it peripheral. Don't do that. Make it anterior and short. Then induce hypotony. This is a, uh, an angle of a well-pressurized eye. And then after gaping it, you can suddenly see what you didn't see before. Maybe you thought when you looked at this, this was a mesh work, but that's the ciliary body. The meshwork and the canal are anterior to that, and by inducing hypotony, you get reflux. Next point, why can you not engage it? Why are there, why are there stories about uh, cyclodialysis clefts? Well, the reason is, as a beginner surgeon, you're so anxious to get into the structure. You're pushing hard, it's an awkward positioning, and you push straight across, you're parallel to the tissue, and you cannot engage. And then you slip out, patient gets nervous because you feel something's not going right, and boom, the device goes out into the supercortical space, perhaps. So try this a little more off to the left. The angle of attack is key. Point and engagement means you're getting easily into the meshwork because it's not a wall that's parallel to how you engage it. It, it is actually a dome. So you have to use the scleral spur here as a landmark and go up in a 45 degree angle. The nice thing about the scleral spur is that it will also resist the push that you exert, so it will not collapse. If you engage it parallel out, you collapse the structure and the meshwork pushes against the outer wall and you cannot engage it and hook it. When you're blading, after you're in and you advance it to the left, Continue to not push outward. I've shown you what's outward. The outer wall is full of collector channels. If you push outward like I did on my first patients, you will get scar formation and fibrosis over these tiny little delicate 50 micron intakes. So maybe you want to set your mind to pull inward a little bit, tenting the meshwork, 
inward towards you. Treat it like an apparatus membrane, really. Think of it not like a trabeculectomist who wants to punch 500 micron holes, who throws sutures in, who pulls with 0.12 or 0.3 forceps. This is a lazy, very delicate tissue. Treat it like an apparatus membrane. Think of what's behind it. So how does this look? How do you engage properly? It looks like a Zen moment, up and in to the left. It doesn't look hard, and it is not hard. If you have done hundreds, you don't even think about it anymore. Here's a non-pigmented, up and in to the left without much resistance. You don't want to see the eye rotate when you advance it. If you see the eye rotate, you know that you are actually stuck in the outer wall, maybe in a little collector orifice. Okay. Next point that I made before, aim for 180 degrees ablation. More is more. Engage, then you rotate the lens towards the area of ablation, and in order to extend your reach, lift the heel off the cornea. This allows you a more direct view, almost like with a copy lens, of the meshwork. That will give you an enormous reach. You can easily ablate 180 degrees. It is possible. There's no reason why you couldn't. Going to the other side is a little awkward because you have to pronate your hand suddenly, but you can also roll the device between your fingers. And again here, uh, another 100, uh, 360 degree image, courtesy Larry Kagaman, that shows you why you want to do more and why canaloplasty or other stenting will only give you access to segments. Is there any data? And this is, uh, this is data by uh, offer Sit, and um, he came to the conclusion, more is not more. Uh, but actually, I think <laughs> his poster actually showed just that. And it was maybe not powered enough to, to pick this really up. But what you see here is the more ablation you do, the lower your pressure. It was not statistically significant, but pretty close. All right, after the trabectum, you're done. You've ablated it. You haven't hurt the outer wall. What do you do next? Before the cataract, even. Tamponate it with discovisc. Discovisc, uh, and I have no financial interest in this, you want to use a viscoelastic that has both dispersive properties that allows you to squeeze some viscoelastic into these orifices and at the same time has the staying power of cohesive viscoelastic so it doesn't dislodge right away as you manipulate more in the anterior chamber. You want to use the same incision now for the cataract that's usually following heel down and sort of the ceiling shelf incision. You do the phaco, and again, after the phaco, you tamponate this ablation side with a viscoelastic, for instance, with discovisc, that I found worked best for me out of five. Use a tension ring. You can do torque lenses. Why? Well, it's not a trabeculectomy. You're not inducing any weird, unpredictable astigmatism. So you can do you can create really happy patients with really good outcomes, as with all these mix that do not induce um, high levels of astigmatism. You get a surgeon factor out of this incision. And at the end, leave some viscoelastic behind. Why is that important? Well, there are many publications that show that our nice clear corneal incisions suck, literally. They suck back stuff from the, from the ocular surface. And that's because although you've sealed it with BSS, they're not pressurized to the point where 10 minutes out or half an hour later, they would, the eye would become hypotenus. So it's important to get some means of getting the flow from within the anterior chamber to have a gradient towards the collector channels. And you do that, for instance, by leaving up to 30% of viscoelastic in the AC. You will get, not get dangerously high pressures from that. It's similar with tube shunts. All right. Post-op, prepare your patient to have blurriness for a few days. If they're devastated by the blurriness, you should congratulate them. If you see a big hyphema, that means they have actually a working conventional outflow system. That is, that is important to know. Reflux means a lot of flow. This is basic plumbing. And then what I do is um, I use a pilocarpine four times a day for one month then three times a day for another month, and sometimes even twice a day for another month to keep the iris flat and not get the root of the iris aspirated by the unroofed Schlems canal. Pret forte, you can taper quite quickly. Although you've ablated tissue and potentially created a wound response, these patients are much, sometimes more comfortable than um, cataract patients with a prolonged iritis. Why? 
Well, maybe because the mesh work isn't there anymore. Maybe because you don't have this uh, loop of antigen presentation, um, any means of inciting more inflammation. You just, you know, think of it as a kitchen sink. If you remove a strainer, anything can go into that big uh, intake. So in summary, get a good microscope. If you save on the microscope, you will not get this to work. Probably not any mix. Mix meaning minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. Don't use viscoelastic. Yes, you want to maintain the chamber, but not here. Then you want to induce hypotony. Gape the wound, identify it with a gonier lens. Make sure you know what the mesh work is. The technique we discussed, and here, and flare it. And during the ablation, do not push outward. You will lose your collectors. Try 180. You know, you, you, you might remember the handshake that the um, that, uh, that canaloplasty trainers do, the club, welcome to the club 360, you should be in the club 180. Aim for more, not just two clock hours or something. And then third, we discussed reducing hyphema, leave some viscoelastic behind, that's not gonna be dangerous, it will pressurize and will help for a better outcome.